Praise the Lord. We close our eyes. We present ourselves to Jesus. Hold our hands close to our heart. Ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord, you continue to speak. We will continue to listen and to receive. Let your mercy and grace fill our hearts. Let your plans for us be known and be understood. You speak to us, Jesus. Be your children. Listen. reading from the gospel according to Luke chapter 24 verses 13 onwards now on the same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened while they were talking and discussing Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you, were walk while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us? while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. At same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. They found the leaven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord Remembering our primary intention for this retreat, we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray, pray for, for us sinners. sinners.
now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Kindly be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Once again, good, good afternoon, dear friends. That is good. So this session um, is supposed to finish at 4.15. I don't think it's going to finish at 4.15. So it's supposed to be a 45-minute session. So I don't think it's going to finish at 4.15. It might, might take around 5-10 minutes more. So be patient. Don't worry. We will adjust it in the, in the uh, session after dinner. Is that fine? You have no other option. Because I am definitely going to take that extra time. Praise God. So as we are journeying through our discipleship, it is, it is important. Jesus wants us to be rooted in certain things. So that we who are constantly, constantly tempted by things from this world needs to be rooted in Christ. We need to be always rooted in Christ. Where you are rooted is where you get your nourishment from. If you are rooted in the world, we will get our nourishment from the world. If you are rooted in Christ, we will get our nourishment from? I can't hear you. Good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So two, two areas where the Lord really wants us to be rooted so that we do not, de we do not deviate are seen in the walk to Emmaus. That's the gospel passage we just read. The word tells us Jesus had told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He told them, wait in Jerusalem. But here we read about two disciples. Now on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. What does it mean, seven miles? Why is it mentioned seven miles from Jerusalem? Seven, according to the Israelites, is a complete number. Now these disciples were meant to be in Jerusalem. What are they doing? Father Joe's pushed you all to sleep. I thought Vincent woke you all up. Sometimes that is how it is, right? At um, late night or early morning when we go off to sleep and suddenly we wake up. After that, what do we do? We'll promptly go back to sleep. And that is all. Did Father Joe put you to sleep? Vincent waked you up. Now Father Michael's come. You're continuing sleep. I can't hear you. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So uh, what does that seven miles mean? So seven, like I told you, is a complete number. Now they were meant to be in Jerusalem. What are they doing? They are moving away from Jerusalem. Moving away from Jerusalem is an indication of them moving away from their discipleship. So Jerusalem should be understood as their discipleship. They are supposed to be in Jerusalem in their discipleship. They are now moving away. Seven miles is a complete number. It's a complete moving away from their discipleship. Now we are all called to discipleship. It's not that only the priest is called to discipleship. Every baptized Christian is called to discipleship. All of us are called to discipleship. But here we see them moving seven miles from Jerusalem. Seven miles completely away from their discipleship and how evident it is is seen in the next few verses while they were talking and discussing Jesus himself came near and went with them but their eyes were kept from recognizing him their eyes were kept from recognizing him they couldn't even recognize the Lord now how many days since they've seen Jesus? How many days since the Lord has, um, it was the Lord's death? Just three days. In three days, they're not able to recognize even the face of Jesus. 
It's an indication of how far they're going from their discipleship. You cannot forget a person's face in three days. Isn't that true? You cannot forget a person's voice in three days. Isn't that true? They've been with him for three years. They heard him every day for three years. They looked at his face every day for three years. In three days, will you forget my face? Don't you dare. After all, one after the other, I'm taking sessions for you all. You all shouldn't forget me in three days. Just imagine, three days and they've forgotten the face of the Lord. It is all pointing to an indication of the state of their discipleship. How far they are going away from the Lord. So we read, the word says, how disappointed. The further they are away from the Lord, the more disappointed they are. And that is why the word says, they stood still looking sad. They are now very disappointed in their discipleship. They are sad. And then when Jesus asked them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place? What did they call him? Stranger. When you go far away from discipleship, Jesus becomes a stranger. Are you the only stranger? There's no connection at all. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? And then they say, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God. How our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Did you find anything surprising in the way they've constructed their sentences? It is all in past tense. We had believed, we had hoped. That means now nothing is there. We don't believe anymore. We are struggling in our belief. So it shows how far they were from their discipleship. How far they were from, from that union with Jesus. Now, the word says, they say, yes, besides all this, it is now the third day. And women in the group have told us, they've astounded us, they said, that they did not find his body there. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. You're so slow in believing what the prophets declared. So even though these disciples were walking far away from their discipleship, did Jesus give up on them? No. The Lord will never give up on us. He will never give up on us. Even when at times we deviate and we move away from our discipleship, the Lord will never give up on you. He will come behind you and He will find you. And He will drag you back to your discipleship. But He will not give up on you. Always know this. When you are, when you are afraid about your children who have lost faith, and don't believe anymore, know one thing in your heart, that the Lord will not give up. The Lord himself says, I will go in search of that sheep that has strayed. Always know that in your heart, the Lord will never give up on us. He will always go in search. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. So that is one comfort you need to keep within your heart. Whatever happens, the Lord will not give up on me. Maybe I will reject my discipleship. Maybe I will give up on God. 
maybe i will do things that are not worthy of the lord but my lord will never give up on me he will keep searching till he finds he finds them and he says how foolish you are and then what does he do two very important things start happening now we read in verse 26 luke 24:26 was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. So what is he doing now? These disciples, he worked with them and walked with them for three full years. And in three years, in three days, what has happened? They have forgotten everything. They have forgotten everything. And what does he do? Starting right from Moses, he starts once again reteaching everything to them. You know how hard that is? Any teachers over here? How many teachers raise your hands? All the teachers? Only half teacher? Part time? Full time? Teachers, raise your hands. Yeah. Teachers will know that you teach students. You break your back and you're teaching your students. And then having to teach them all over again if they forget it. Very frustrating. I remember I, don't, I, I, I wasn't a teacher for a very long time, but I was doing my one year of Regency. That's our practical training. We do our minor seminary, we do our novitiate, then we have our three years of philosophy, and then after that we have a one year of practical training. So they send us to one of our Vincentian houses, and we stay there with a little community that is um, either one priest or two priests will be there. So I was sent uh, to the state of Maharashtra in India, and uh, to a very, uh, very interior uh, township, and there we have a school. And I was asked by the principal, who is one of our priests, I was asked to teach the children in the school as well. So I was teaching children from the um, primary three. Did I get it right? Oh, miracle. Primary three to form eight. No? What? Form two. Oh, okay, form two. Okay, form two. So that is after after seventh, eighth. So so seventh for you is form one, right? Okay, so form two. So till form two. So they were all in the school. So I was teaching them in different uh, different classes, and for the for the for the uh, primary four, I was taking history for them. Now, history, I thought, is very easy. You know, after all, it's only history. What's in the book only you can teach. You don't need um, any, any great big knowledge to be able to teach history. As long as it's in the book, you can teach it to the children. That's what I thought. So I started teaching the children. There were, there were around uh, 40 children in that class. And I started teaching. One thing about teaching students is when you teach, the front benches... They're the ones who, I don't know how it's in your schools, but in our schools, the children just choose their places. And the front benchers are the brilliant ones. They'll be sitting over there. And when you teach, they'll look at you with bright eyes and they'll do this, yes, yes. That's the Indian way, yes, 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 yes. So that means they've understood everything. So I was very satisfied with myself. I thought these children understand everything. That's very good. And I, f I finished around one month or two months and I put a unit test for them. That is a class test. It's an internal test. And I took the papers back and at night I sat and corrected the papers. And after correcting the papers, I found out that out of the 40 students, 14 of them, one four, 14 of them got zero. <laughs> the marks given for them was zero. Not even failed. Failed was another number. This is zero. And I was so disappointed. I thought to myself, I taught them all this and they've not understood anything. 
And I went and told the principal, I said, I'm not made for this, so please take me out of it. And he said, no, no, you just continue to try. And when I went back the first day after that, and I entered the classroom, it was so scary. Because I knew I have to now start all over again. To teach all over again. Three years he taught them. Three days they forgot everything. And now what does he have to do? He reinterpreted the scriptures for them. He opened it out once again. But he needed to do that. Because the scriptures was going to be one of the foundations of their discipleship. If they didn't know the scriptures, they would never understand. Jesus and the resurrection. They needed to know the word of God. So the Lord didn't just let them go. Rather, he reinterpreted the word to them all again. All over again. The scriptures is a necessity and that is why the Lord tells us this as well. In our own discipleship, he will keep speaking to us and interpreting the scriptures to us. We should, we should desire to know God's word. It is very, very important. Sadly, for us Catholics, that is one area where we are terribly weak. Where we don't open the scriptures and we don't read. We don't pray the scriptures. God speaks to us through His Word. We need to open our ears and listen to His Word. Every day. It is very, very essential. Saint Jerome says, ignorance of the scriptures is the ignorance of Christ. I need to open God's Word. I need to know what the Lord is speaking to me. What is God saying? What is the Spirit interpreting to me? The Lord Himself says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 3. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 33, verse 3. God says, Call to me and I will answer. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. I will speak to you. I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not yet known. So to open our hearts to God's word and to listen to God's word, to pray God's word, we are not using this as a storybook. This is God speaking to his people. Do we not want to listen? Do we not want to hear what he has to say? So often we read so many things out there. We have time to read so many articles, so many books. Don't we want to hear God speaking to us? So often you have people come and ask, Father, pray. I don't know what is God's will. Well, if you don't know God's scripture, you will struggle to understand God's will. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. A famine of the word is what the scripture actually talks about. In the book of Amos, chapter 8, book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11, God says, The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. There will be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. They will not listen to me. They will not hear my word. There will be a famine of the word. We shouldn't be the generation that experiences this. We shouldn't be the generation that does not hear God's word. We shouldn't be the generation 
that is empty of God's word. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. If Jesus found it important to go behind the disciples who had moved away from Jerusalem and he kept speaking the word to them and reinterpreting the word to them and he didn't think, if you're gone, you're gone, don't worry. But if he could spend that time with us, that is how important the word was for him. That is why even when Jesus was tempted, you know the temptation? Yes? Jesus fasted for 40 days, 40 nights and after that he was, was tempted. Three temptations came about, right? How did Jesus defend himself? Through the word. All the three times he says, it is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, thou shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, it's the scripture, it's the word. We need the word to protect us. We need to know God's word so that it will be the light to our feet. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Don't you want to know which direction to take? Yes or no? Yes. God's word gives us that direction. You should every day pray God's word. Not read it like a storybook. This is not a race to try and finish when to try and think when I can finish everything. I'm not much of an avid reader, but when, when I used to read books uh, earlier, nowadays of course I go through the normal process, but earlier when I used to read books, I would take the first page and read it. And then I'll turn to the last page to see the ending. If the ending is good, then I'll read the rest. But no, this is not a race to finish something. It is a prayer that becomes a part of us. The scripture is always a prayer that becomes a part of us. It's the lamp to my feet and it's the light to my path. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So that is what Jesus did with the disciples who were going towards, towards Emmaus. He then speaks to them, reinterprets the whole scripture to them. Praise the Lord. And that is what they speak about in, 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 in verse 32, Luke 24 verse 32. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. That is what the word does. It, it burns within us. Were not our hearts burning within us when he was interpreting the scriptures to us. Praise the Lord. Every day when you read the word, it becomes a very strong pillar of your discipleship. Your discipleship journey requires the voice of God. The voice of God is in the scripture of God. Open your ears and listen. Make an effort to read. Have a Bible of your own. Sadly, in some homes, you have a family Bible. We have family Bibles, but we have personal mobile phones. Do you have, pers you, do you have a family mobile? No. Do you have a personal mobile? Then why is it that only the Bible is family Bible? Shouldn't it be your own personal one? Yes. Because the scripture speaks to me differently from how the scripture speaks to you. So what I write down, if my, my Bible is all written and marked out everywhere, I will never give this to anyone. Even if my mother asks me, I won't give it to her. She wants to let her go and get her own Bible. This is mine. This is God speaking to me. This is my scripture. Have your own scripture. Have your Bible. And pray the Bible every day. Spend time and pray the Bible every day. That is what Jesus insisted on with these disciples. Now that was one thing. 
Now the Emmaus incident, these disciples, like we told you, um, these disciples are moving away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is there. You forgot. Seven. So what is it? It is their discipleship. Jerusalem is the discipleship. They are moving away from their discipleship. Now Jesus has come. He has reinterpreted the scriptures to them. Their hearts are burning, right? So after this, now what happens? What do they do? Praise the Lord. They don't go back. So let's go on. Verse 28. This is after Jesus reinterprets the whole scriptures to them. Verse 28. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. So Jesus was acting. He was acting like he's going to go ahead. Imagine that. He's waiting for them to call him. So he's only acting that he's going ahead. And the word tells us, they look at Jesus and they say, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. Because it is almost night. Stay with us. It is, it is night. Night in the scriptures is an indication of the darkness of the state of the heart. Do you remember Nicodemus in the Bible? Nicodemus is, a, is, is one of the scribes. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. The word tells us he comes to Jesus by, by night. It is the state of his soul. Night always is an indication of the state of the soul. So here it says... They tell him, they urge him strongly, stay with us because it is, it is night. It's the state of their heart. Still, it is the state of their heart. Remember what I'm saying? Still, it is the state of their heart. Even though the scripture was interpreted to them. Even though the word was interpreted to them. And then we read, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them. What was happening there? The Eucharist was taking place. So when they were going away from the discipleship, Jesus did not only use the word, he used the Eucharist as well. It is not only about the word, it is also about the Eucharist. It is not only about the word, it is also about the Eucharist. We read, it goes on, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him so even though the word was proclaimed to them were their eyes opened as yet no but they say our hearts were our hearts were burning but were their eyes opened not yet the eyes were opened in the celebration of the holy eucharist the eyes were opened in the celebration of the holy eucharist that is why it says it was night it was still darkness. But the moment the Eucharist took place, the word says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. He vanished from their sight. So where did he go? Where did he go? Somewhere else. Where did he go? Tell me. Jerusalem. Where did he go? I can't hear you. Where did he go? He didn't go to Jerusalem. He is in the bread. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 6. When you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will be in you. He is in the bread. 
they don't have to see him physically anymore that is what jesus says when he takes the bread in john chapter john chapter 6 you know john chapter 6 is very interesting because it starts out with what miracle the miracle of feeding the 5000 the 5000 and more five loaves two fish jesus blesses it multiplies it and they are very excited free bread everyone was very happy all of us would be very happy isn't it yes free bread so what happens the next day they go back home when they come back the next day they can't find him so they cross over the lake to the other side they find Jesus and they look at the Lord and they say Lord where were you we looked everywhere for you so much of love right and the Lord looked at them and said you are looking for me only because I gave you bread to eat yesterday and then in John chapter 6 he starts speaking extensively about the Holy Eucharist and very deeply about the Holy Eucharist when he starts saying whoever eats this bread Whoever eats this bread will live forever. John chapter 6, it's all full. John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verse 50. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Is my flesh. In verse 52. Then Jews disputed amongst themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What is this cannibalism? How can he give us his flesh to eat? He says, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats me will live because of me. He goes deeper and deeper into the Holy Eucharist as he explains to them about that bread of life the Holy Eucharist now the same people came behind Jesus and told them Lord where were you we missed you so much and then the Lord told all this and in verse 60 we read John chapter 6 verse 60 when many of his disciples heard it they said this teaching is too difficult who can accept it it's too difficult when it was about five loaves and two fish that was multiplied oh that's good that's nice that's interesting isn't it just as much as if suppose someone was here paralyzed and starts walking would it be interesting oh it would be very interesting it's like the bread that was multiplied the miracle that can be seen but now there's a miracle that's taking place that they are not able to understand. They said, this teaching is just too difficult. Who can accept it? And in verse 66 it says, because of this, many of his disciples turned back. They no longer went about with him. Who were they? Who were they? I just read it. Yes, who were they? They were disciples. They were disciples. They walked with Jesus. They saw the miracles. They saw the blind man get healed. They saw the deaf get, hear, get the hearing. They saw the dead come back to life. During all that they praised the Lord. Now, when they couldn't understand something he said, they said, this teaching is so difficult, who can accept it? And they walk off. And they walked away. Jesus asked Peter and the twelve, so Peter, do you also wish to go away? Because that's what the Lord was saying. Peter, if you want to go, you can go. 
but I'm not changing my teaching just because you're not happy about it. The Lord's not going to change His teaching about the Eucharist just because I'm not happy about it. What He says is said. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And what does Peter reply? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the word of eternal life. Have you said it is you in the Eucharist? I will believe it is you in the Eucharist. That is faith for you. That is why when these disciples are moving towards Emmaus, here Jesus um, has, the, has the breaking of the bread and now he has vanished. Why? Because he's in the bread. When we celebrate the Eucharist over here and the words of consecration are said, it is the body and blood of Christ. You know, in, in Italy, there's a place called Lanciano. Has anybody been there? Yes. How many of you have been there? There's the Eucharistic miracle, the first Eucharistic miracle that took place over there. And it is, it is there the bread that turned into flesh. Even now, if you go over there, you can see the, the bread that has turned to, to flesh. It happened because the priest was not able to believe that it is the real presence of Jesus. And at that moment, there was a beautiful miracle that took place. And even now, when you go to Lanciano, you can actually see that bread that has turned into a piece of flesh. It is still over there. How many of you would love to go to Lanciano to see that miracle? Can you raise your hands? How many of you would love to go? Raise your hands. Why do you want to go here every day in the Eucharist? It is there. We still want to go to Lanciano. Every day in the Holy Eucharist, He is there. His real presence, not a symbolic presence. Jesus did not tell his disciples, you take and eat, this is a symbol of my body. He didn't say, this is a symbol of my blood. He said, this is my body, this is my blood. Every day when I partake of the Eucharist in the body and blood of Jesus, in the sacred host and the sacred blood of Jesus, it is the presence of Christ. That is why Jesus disappeared. That is why he disappeared the moment the consecration took place and he broke bread. He's now in the bread. That is why their eyes opened. Not because it was a symbolic presence, but because it was the real presence. Their eyes are now opened and they recognized him. When they recognized him, he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And then in verse 33, that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Do you find that strange? Do you find that strange? That verse, that same hour, they got up and they went back to Jerusalem. Do you find something strange or special there? What did they tell Jesus? Stay with us because it is night. Now what happened to the night? That night was an indication of the darkness of their heart. Once they celebrated the Eucharist and partook of Jesus, their eyes are now opened, the night is banished, the light has come, and the word tells us they return to Jerusalem, back to their discipleship. They go back to their discipleship. The Eucharist, as long in our discipleship journey, dear brothers and sisters, be rooted in God's word and be rooted in his Eucharist. 
be rooted in God's word and be rooted in his Eucharist. And every time we are rooted in the Eucharist, irrespective of which priest is celebrating it there, it doesn't matter. The Eucharist and its sacredness and its validity and its holiness and its power is not based on the priest. It works within itself. It is a sacrament. When you come in with faith, you come in with reverence, you come in with awe and you want to partake of. That is when the eyes are always kept open and we get to see the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. That is what happens in the last verse. Verse 35 of Luke 24. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made, made known to them in the breaking of the bread in the Eucharist. Dear brothers and sisters, very, very important. You will finish this retreat tomorrow and you will go back. But you will sustain yourself not on this retreat. You will have to sustain yourself with God's word and the Holy Eucharist. That is where you sustain yourself. If possible, if you can go to church every day, go to church every day. If you can go for the Eucharist every day, go for the Eucharist every day. And pray the scripture every day. Very, very important. Because as 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says, Satan is waiting around, prowling around like a roaring lion, waiting to devour. He's waiting for a slip up from us. We have to protect ourselves. And we've been given beautiful graces in, in, the, in the word the Lord has spoken and in the, in, in the Eucharist where he gives of himself to us. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So have great passion for God's word. Have great passion for the Holy Eucharist. You know, I always think to myself, sometimes we always think maybe it has to be a, a very good priest. Only then the Eucharist will be very, very good. No, that's not true. You have to come in with a heart that is passionate. Then you will see that the Eucharist will become an experience. You know, in my parish, Many years ago in my hometown parish, there was a priest who used to be there, nasty, I'm sorry to say. But it was because he was also elderly and he, had, he was diabetic and, and he would be very moody at many times and he'd, be, he'd get angry and he'd be in between the mass, he'd look at us and he'd say, stop that, what are you doing? You know, people used to all come back and everyone will gossip after mass. Oh, what a priest, oh, what a priest. And I would see my mother. And she would have tears that are flowing during the Eucharist. And I would think, you know, I wonder what she's crying about. Because I was the only reason she needed to cry at that time. So I was the pain. But when we come back home, she will always look and say, such a beautiful mass. And all of us in the house would be open our mouth and think, what is she talking about? But that was how she went for the mass. It didn't matter what the priest was doing there. It didn't matter how moody the priest was. For her, she was prepared. And she went in. And for her, it was an experience. When we are well prepared and we go, it will turn into an experience. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Let us all stand. Let's close eyes.
offer ourselves to the Lord. Let us offer our hearts to Jesus, offering our discipleship. Lord, we pray for your mercy and grace that we hold on strongly to your word and we hold on reverently to your Holy Eucharist. Open our eyes that we might see. name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So we don't have a break now, right? No break. There's no breaks. No break for you. So there's going to be the, the praise and worship and then Father will come for the session. Don't worry. We will adjust the, the extra time that I've taken according to the time we start the Mass. Don't worry.